the competition, such as it is the only acceptance speech Elvis Presley has ever done, is to collect this award. Um, and every year it recognises people between the ages of 18 and 40 who are excelling in all different areas of their life, whether that's technical or moral leadership, people from the entertainment industry, all sorts of different people there. Um, so we're delighted to be joined by a couple of our 2020 JCI UK honorees um, later on, and we'll be submitting them to the global competition this year. So we're keeping our fingers crossed um, for some global wins there. Once we've um, finished with that panel discussion and that panel discussion, we will be keen for you to get involved with as well and ask your questions. Uh, we will go into the networking session and split down to a few breakout rooms so we have the opportunity um, to get to know each other a bit better. And we'll then bring everything to close at one o'clock. So those of you who are blessed with wonderful weather can be back out and about by one o'clock. So I'm just going to pass over now to the woman in charge, uh, Ms. Phoebe Benter. Hi, um, and thank you so much, um, Alona and Bianca, for organizing this event. Uh, and thanks everybody here for joining. This is really excited. And for a Saturday morning, you know, to see everybody up and engaging with JCI, I think this is really exciting. So today is all about the core of JCI, and that is developing leaders. I am very excited that we are always looking for new ways to provide these opportunities for young people. And today, as Alona mentioned, we have a fantastic lineup of speakers and workshops um, and getting us really into the leadership mindset. I joined JCI in 2015 and JCI has been a big part of my professional development from all the training events, leadership academies. I've learned so much that has enabled me to be promoted numerous times, been offered opportunities that I never would have even thought of. And I could definitely say JCI has been a core part of my professional and personal development. So my message for you this morning is to be present, ask questions, be proactive with your career. And JCI is a great network to help you reach your true potential. So I just, again, wanna thank all of you for joining this session today. It was an idea we had at the beginning of the year. We wanna pull this event together, get young people together, have some experiences and some stories we could hear from, as well as some practical experience, which we have the workshop involved. So I look forward to interacting with you throughout the day, throughout the breakout sessions and the networking. And again, any questions, feel free to drop a message in the chat. We are so excited to have you here today. And for me as well, just a warm welcome to JCI UK's um, develop leadership and development event. So thank you. And Alona? Thanks ever so much, Phoebe. And I've just popped on um, the next slide there, which shows you um, who the national board team is. I know we have a few of them on the call today. Um, so have a look out for them um, and they'll definitely be able to tell you a little bit more about the organisation. Um, but what's really important for me with JCI is that regardless of what our roles might be, we're all members. It's a membership organisation. It's a learning by doing organisation. Whilst I'm here today in the hosting role, I am absolutely sitting here waiting to see what I can learn and, and how I can become a better leader. And it's great to see that everyone on the national board is in that position still of giving back to the organisation and running it for the new people who are coming through, um, but also still absolutely thriving on getting together and helping ourselves to be better. So next up, we have Jeremy Suddard, Chief Executive Officer of Aptitude Software. Now, hopefully what is going to happen when I stop sharing is that we will be able to have Jeremy share his own slides and um, to be able to take you through his journey um, and offer some insights into how he's been leading through this period of change. Jeremy, is that working okay for you? If not, I do have a copy of your slides and you can step into the prime minister role of, of shouting next slide at me when you need it. Are you just on mute there, Jeremy? Yeah, I am um, trying to share, but I'm struggling just about a second though. No problems. Could you share for me, Elaine? That's probably the easiest I way. I certainly then, can. Um, this is why we have a backup. We're ready to go. I'll, I'll tell you for why. Um, so I had um, four or five days holiday 
um, about a week ago, which was which 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 felt amazing, given the fact I wasn't actually away with my family. And the and the first day back, I put my laptop and my iPad in my briefcase, and I put my cup of coffee that I take to take on the on the uh, on the train with me, and I closed the lid and I put that in my briefcase, um, and I picked up my briefcase, and of course the top wasn't on the coffee, and my briefcase turned into a a swimming pool of of, <laughs> of, of high quality coffee and a laptop that 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 hasn't been great. So that, so I am on a backup laptop. So apologies, it happens to it happens to the best of us. It so listen, just thank shows, you very much. It? We're all about dealing with the obstacles so just shout at me whenever you want your next slide Perfect. and no, take no, it away fine. so yeah thanks very much for the time jc i really appreciate um the opportunity to come and chat to you um yeah my name is jeremy sadars i'm the chief executive officer of Baptist plc um we are a business which is about 400 people strong um we have uh as people in almost every uh, part of the globe, North America, Asia, across Europe, cent Central Europe, and we build um, software for uh, financial management, particularly for banks, for insurance companies, and for technology businesses. Uh, we are a PLC, which means I have a set of, uh, of uh, shareholders, uh, investors, long-term investors, and, and a board to manage. Um, and I have to say, you know, I, I often pinch myself that I'm doing the job I'm doing. Um, I didn't set out to be a CEO of a PLC business. Um, but actually the decisions I made along the way probably you know, led, led me to where I am. And actually for me, talking about you know, what those decisions are, you know, the, the things that I think worked well, the things that I think that, uh, that maybe I, I could have done better, I think just all useful. Um, a, it reminds me of, uh, of what I need to do, but also hopefully people get some, some view along, along the way. So when I thought about the presentation, um, you know, I titled it Ambition, Adjacency and Achievement. Um, and that wasn't because there was any sort of great big creative thought process behind that. But I think it's sort of went the way I think about, um, you know, um, my, my career. But also I think about that for my personal life as well. If you could just go down the slide, please, Alona. Because as well as being a CEO to, uh, to Aptitude PLC, I'm also a husband. Uh, I'm a father. Um, I'm a music lover. Um, uh, just go back at one. Uh, I'm a I'm a fisherman, um, and I'm also a petrol head. And all of those things to me are as important as the job that I do on a day to day basis, because actually creating the headspace to be great at work, creating the headspace to be able to look after my employees and my investors and my my wider stakeholders means that I really need to find the time to have some downtime away from that. And having that, that, that balance between my family and some of my hobbies is also really, really important. I've got a black screen, Alona. Yeah, I was just going to say that middle slide, for some reason, it isn't loading. The next one is your tell me a story uh, slide. So just let me know when right, you're no ready problem. for it. That's fine. Go to, go to let me tell you a story then. That's fine. So I've only got about three or four slides, guys, because my view is that, you know, often slides can distract from the message that, uh, that you're really trying to listen to. And, you know, from the age of about six or even younger, you know, the six words, let me tell you a story, I think probably grab most of our attention more than anything else. And so whilst I've got some bullet points, I'm going to try and tell a few stories through my career that I think have really defined who I am. Um, actually, things that I think I've, I've learned from, even if not at the time. As I said, I didn't set out to be CEO. There was no great epiphany at the age of eight where I decided that was what I was going to do. In fact, I really struggled at that age. I struggled at school. I struggled to stand out. But I did always find myself in leadership positions. Whatever I did, I seemed to create some kind of fellowship. So clearly I was doing something right. But I just wasn't really sure what it was. And it's probably taking me 20 or 30 years to really kind of carve out what some of those things are. I wasn't great at school. I was never tested for dyslexia, but I'm pretty sure I am. So I had to lean on a whole set of other things to really work out how I could be successful over the years. Yes, my grades weren't great. I wasn't great at maths, but my mental arithmetic was fantastic. And I actually put that down to the fact that I worked from a very, very early age in my father's butcher's shop, selling behind the counter, adding up how many pork pies somebody had bought, what a quarter of ham would be. And actually working out the areas that can drive your brain faster and focusing on those areas, I think, make a, make a really big difference. Actually, trying to get your brain to do something that it's not designed to do is always really, really hard. 
So you have a whole set of strengths, which of course you're born with and that are very easy for you to leverage. And there are others that you really need to learn. But I think being aware of some of those is also really, really important. So yeah, I started work at probably the age of 11. Through that period of time, I worked in the, the butcher shop. I worked selling, uh, washing cars and eventually selling cars. I worked in a clothes shop. I worked in a supermarket. And all of those roles were before I was 17. So I wasn't really sure what I was going to do. I was still, of course, at school. I was still working through. But it wasn't until I happened to uh, end up in a, a role in what was Curry's, which was uh, a white goods uh, a shop at the time, selling washing machines, dishwashers, TVs to the general public, that I really found my calling. I really loved that engagement with people. I really loved that instant gratification of being able to fulfill somebody's ambitions where they'd been saving for many years for something or a need that they could fulfill as well. And it was actually during that period of time, working in that retailer, that I literally fell into technology. I fell into technology because at the time, nobody was selling computers. The, the thought of a PC in someone's home was, was, was almost bizarre. And at school, I'd never been allowed near any PCs because I simply wasn't in the high enough grade. So for me, again, being asked to get involved in this was, was, was quite a departure. However, I was sent away on a day release course for five days over, over a period of five weeks. I learned about what a PC was. I learned what software was. I learned what the, back, what the background was. And I was then suddenly let loose to build what they called was a business center inside Dixon Stores Group in the Harrogate store. I was really pleased. I was excited. I went and got my own little business cards printed. I really felt I'd arrived. I really felt that I could make a difference here. And actually, I was catching a wave. And I think it's really important when you think about your careers, are you catching a wave? Are you in something that's really going to drive momentum through your own career? And I think all the way through my career and all the way through you know, the, the challenges that I see, I'm always looking for those waves, those momentums, because the wind with the wind behind you, it makes a huge amount of difference to what you can achieve. Um, and I think recognizing that and actually sometimes facing up to that is super, super important. Can you go to the next slide, please? Elena. And on again. So if I think about ambition, I think it comes in lots and lots of different ways. Um, and I think, first of all, it always moves. So as I say, I didn't set out to be the CEO of a PLC business when I was eight. Actually, when I was eight, I wanted a company car and I wanted to wear a suit to work. That is, for me, what I thought would be an achievement if I was out, at, out, out in work. Of course, achieving that when I was 20 or 21, um, working for what was a really a, sm a very, very small startup when, when, when I left the retail business, of course, was just down in the sand. It was just something I'd achieved. It was a means to an end, and it was part, part of the journey. But actually, as part of that, my, my thought process and my ambition extended and widened. And whilst working for a startup, which was literally, we, we didn't call them startups then, we called them one-man bands. It was the founder, it was an engineer, and me tramping around uh, the, the Yorkshire Dales with a, in, in, in my, my Vauxhall Vectra and, and, my, uh, and my suit was really generating business from the ground up. This was a business that really hadn't had you know, any, any backing. It was self-funded. But actually, as I worked through that, my, my ambition moved. And my ambition moved to wanting to work for a big brand in the technology space. And over that time, again, building those experiences, building the, uh, building the activity really meant that I could expand the view of what my future could look like and not leave behind what had happened in the previous 10 years in my academic career, but really opening up the, opening up the world and opening up the opportunities in, in the wider business. If you can just pen down, because I think this slide builds a loaner and then we can just, I'll just work through the, I'll work through the bullets. I think the other thing about ambition is it really, really needs to be aligned with your personal values. If you're doing a role or your ambition is set at an area because you think that's where it should be for success, I'll tell you, won't achieve it. Every morning you have to get up and know that the role you're doing, the, the outcome you're trying, you're trying to achieve is completely aligned with where you, where you operate personally. And I have been in roles in my time where I've simply felt that it's, it's misaligned with what, with, with what I want to do. 
And I think, you know, being careful and, and making sure that you don't those situations is, is important. I think also no's are way more powerful than yeses. I can think on two or three areas in my career where actually saying no to a job or saying no to a task or saying no to something something additional outside of outside of my role has actually had a much bigger impact being you know the the, the ultra collaborative ultra thoughtful yes yes every time and I can certainly say that it's led to the most iconic parts of my career i.e the roles that have really changed the direction for my career overall so I would urge everybody to really think carefully about you know what are the no's that you've made in your in, in, in your career and what should be going forward I've worked through what is now four major downturns in, our, in, 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 in my career. So Black Wednesday in 1992, uh, when we took Sterling out of the ERM. The dot-com crash in 2001, where literally the market fell out of the tech business in Easter. And we, none of us quite knew what, 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 what had happened because literally the phone stopped ringing, the order books emptied, and we had to rebuild, we had to rebuild businesses from scratch. 2008, the financial crisis. Uh, again, I was sitting in the financial services sector of, of the business I was working in, and then most, most recently in COVID. And I would say in every those situations, certainly in the ones where I was acting as a leader, making sure that the no's I'd said up, up coming to that process, i.e. I hadn't overstretched ourselves, I hadn't overstretched the business, I hadn't overstretched myself, meant that I could manage those in a much better, in a much, in a much better place. The third one around ambition is really, really being influenced by great leaders. And I think it is incumbent on you and me to make sure you pick great leaders if you're looking for roles, if you're looking for mentors, if you're looking for, 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 for influence. And that's not always easy if you're entering into a new organization or you're entering into, into something new. But I think spending time understanding what good leadership looks like has a massive impact on you as an individual. I can sort of look at a number of leaders that I work with over, over, over my time and, I, and I, kind of, I, I kind of group them into certain areas. I have the pace leader who taught me how important pace was in a business. And at the time, I had no idea why he was running around with his hair on fire on the time. It just seemed crazy. Why, why did he think it was so important to be running at such a pace? But that's carried me all the way through my career. There's the radiator leader. A leader who used to come over and sit on the radiator near my desk every Monday morning and have a nice, gentle, collaborative chat with me. We chat about the weekend, we chat about what he did, we chat about the week ahead. And as he walked away every week for three years, I realized he'd extracted some incredibly interesting, important piece of information from me without any kind of conflict, without any challenge, without anything that made me feel uncomfortable but was absolutely key for him being successful and the business being successful overall. And that ability to engage with your stakeholders, your employees, your co-workers is really, really important in a manner that people don't feel threatened. There's the critical thinking leader who frankly was pretty standoffish. The critical thinking leader who you only really took the most difficult problems to that you and your team had spent time working on for weeks or days on an end and really to the end of your tether. Of course, when you took it to the critical thinking leader, he took a pencil or a piece of paper, he laid it out on his desk, and within 30 seconds, he explained to you not only what the solution was, but what the two, other, uh, two or three other scenarios you could, also, you could also take down. But he never made me feel small, he never, he never patronized me, and it was always something that I walked away feeling much more enriched from. And as you add these different leaders into your, your own leadership style, you'll start to build something quite unique for yourself. So I think it's also important that you, you, that, that you look at the leaders that can really make a big difference for you as well. Next couple of, of uh, bullets, please, Elena. Final thing, final two things are, please do not worry about what anybody else is doing. Do not worry about whether you are achieving at the same rate as your coworkers or your friends. Do not worry whether your title is, exact, is, 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 is as exciting as people that you see on LinkedIn. If you focus all your time on yourself and your personality, your personal career, it will be absolutely okay. 
I have seen people around me absolutely fascinated with being a certain level at a certain time, moving their careers around at pace, never really delivering on the op- on, on the goal they want on, on, on the role they've been asked to do. And eventually that comes unstuck. There's a brick wall that you will hit. So please, please, please focus your ambition on what's going to make you tick and what's going to enrich you as an individual, because that means that everything else will just will, will just come, come through. And the final one is. I've really had to focus my career to end up in a general management position. I've had to think about all the different skills, all the different adjacencies, all the different activities I would need to undertake to become essentially a CEO of a a business. And that for me was probably a big um, uh, learning in my mid thirties that I was never gonna specialize in one particular area. I was never going to specialize in sales. I was never going to specialize in marketing. I was never going to specialize in technology. I was never going to specialize in accounting. However, I had a real interest at a certain level in all of those things. And once that realization was there, it allowed me to then think about plotting the rest of my career to become essentially the role I'm doing, the role I'm doing today. And even today, as I look forward and I think about what does the next 10 or 15 years of my career look like, I'm consistently thinking about What are the skills that I'm going to need to achieve that goal in 10 years time or 15 years time? And next slide, please, Elena. So adjacency, I'm not sure how many people have seen this slide. This slide and this picture still absolutely just, just, um, you know, enthuses me every time I see it. If anyone's been to Manhattan and you see some of the skyscrapers that have been built out there and you think about the work that some of these guys in the twenties, it's just, it's just outstanding. And I think the other thing for this slide for me is there's a lot of people who have obviously have huge concern about what's happened in the last 18 months. And many of you will know that, you know, post the Spanish flu and post the World War, first of the First World War, the, the US went into a period of what was called the Roaring Twenties, which was investment in infrastructure. It was cinema halls opening up. It was music halls opening up. And actually, it was one of the strongest decades ahead of the ahead of, of course, the Great Depression that the organi- that, that, that that country has ever seen. So I'm massively excited about what uh, about what 2021 and and, uh, and ahead brings. Can you just build this slide out, please, Elaine? I think that's four. I think that's four points. So why is this? Uh, why is why is the picture useful? I, I think the roles and the jobs that you do, you should think about as ladders or scaffolding. Scaffolding is all about making sure you can build the foundations and you have solid ground on which to launch the next level or the next part of your career or your your ambition as an individual. Ladders quite often are roles that might be much, much shorter, but actually might get you to that level. And I think, again, it's important to recognize whether you are in a role that is scaffolding, is building foundations for the future for you, or are you going to take a role because it is literally a ladder or a bridge to the next role that you really want? But I think when you look at those roles, you've also got to think about the environment that you're working within. You've got to think about the economic environment. You've got to think about the environment of the organization that you might be joining or the industry that you might be trying to break into if you, if you, uh, if you, if you have your own business. And I think you need to consider how many changes are you making to your core skills in that change? I went through a period in a, in, in a very large corporate where I had the ability to add a number of different skills every two years. So I might have added different industries to my, uh, my domain knowledge. I might have added a global nature or an international nature to my knowledge. So, it, so, so add something which wasn't, wasn't changing what I was doing, but it was adding, adding on the development. I might have added another piece of a portfolio. So I may have gone from selling hardware to selling software to selling services. But that ability over a long period of time, probably sort of, you know, eight to 10 years, allowed me to build a whole set of knowledge, a whole set of of skills that allowed me to really jump those those, 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 uh, those, those ladders along the way. The scaffolding became a lot shorter, the ladders became a lot sharper, and it meant I could move through the gears of my career, particularly in my 30s, at real pace. However, to do that, I think you always have to be thinking about two roles ahead. You never, ever want to get your job or your career into a cul-de-sac where you don't know what's going to be next. And if you do that, you have to rethink really your position. So for me, thinking about what does this role do for my next role? 
do I really think if I take this role, which might be better money, it might be different hours, is it really going to be that next ladder or that next scaffold to my next role? And I would say of all the, of all of the, uh, the, the, the sort of career principles I've taken in my time, that's been the one that served me best over the last 30 years. The headhunter test is a bit sort of backward looking. But I have to say, if you look back on your career and a headhunter said to you, so just explain your CV to me. Just walk me through what you've done in the last 15 years. If you can do that with absolute, uh, absolute confidence and there's no left turns or there's no right turns, you probably haven't taken any risks or enough risks. However, by the same token, you need to be thinking about the roles you're taking and actually what will that look like when you are looking for that role that's the ladder to, to, to a serious next job. And I have to say, when I came out of a large corporate and took six months out of the business to go and find what my next job was, the headhunter test was absolutely key. And it was something that I probably learned through, through, through that period. So thinking about those career decisions you take um, is really important because that also drives people, people's uh, understanding and, uh, and thought process as to whether you are thinking longer term or whether you can be distracted very shortly by something that happens to be shiny uh, that, 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 that's, that's just around the corner. And the final point here for me is, is have a mind for the gap. So I think there are times in your career where you do want to do something really different. And, and Alona, you told me yesterday that you'd, uh, you'd, you'd completely changed direction in the last 12 months. And I got to a point that you know, I thought I had the corporate career that I'd always hoped for. I had a PL of over a billion pounds. I had nearly 3,000 people working for me in an organization. And I hit 40. And I suddenly realized that I had a, another 15 to 20 years of really exciting executive career ahead of me. And I simply didn't want to do it in a large corporate organization anymore. But I spent my entire time working my way through that corporate, that, 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 that corporate organization. So I took a call that I simply needed six months to go away and think about what I wanted to do. Now, it was only the fact that I built up um, some good engagements within the business I'd build a, a fantastic network outside of the business. And of course, I'd been reasonably sensible in my time that I could give myself that time to really firstly decompress from that role, but also, also look at what I wanted to do. And I have to say, after a couple of months of pretending to try not to do anything and at least fishing a week and spending loads of time with the kids, I was really quickly back into working out what that next career move would be. And within about two and a half months, I had choices ahead of me as to what I wanted to do. And that's really how I landed at Aptitude, a business that was 40 million pound turnover at the time, was less than 200 people, but actually had the opportunity to grow to be a large enterprise organization. But as importantly for me, I could grow my personal career again on a much longer trajectory, either with, 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 with Aptitude or in, or, or in other organizations. And next slide, please, Alona. So what all of these things essentially allow me to do is yes, it's produced some achievement. Just build, the, build, build that slide out. And I think achievement comes in lots of ways, but mainly it gives you choices. Of course, it's fantastic to have a, uh, you know, a, a, a pot of money at the end of the rainbow. It's great to be able to say that you can afford to do X, Y, and Z, but really achievement is about choices. It's choosing to do what you want to do when you get up in the morning. It's choosing to stop working for six months to decide what you want to do. It's choosing to go and work in another country, in another company. And I think choices are the things that really define us and really give us the energy uh, in, in our career and also in our personal and our professional life as well. I've often talked about the career decisions you make on the way up is a bit like putting 50 pences in a fruit machine. And whilst I wouldn't encourage people to, uh, to, uh, to play the game of risk with your career, the algorithm inside the fruit machine will always pay off. The question is whether you're prepared to stand there long enough and wait for it. So I think patience is also really key because I also think you need to know the time to walk away from a world if it's not working for you and you need time to decide that you need to move to something completely new. But I do think you'll be able to have to be able to stop and recognize, re recognize that. I also think achievement comes in lots of different ways. I spent um, my last five years at Hewlett Packard running the services business, which was an outsourcing and cloud business. And that was back in sort of 2010, when cloud really was, was pretty new, particularly for many, many large financial services companies. And I can remember we were working on a particular deal to put the first financial services application in the country 
onto a cloud technology. Never been done before, seen as hugely risky, regulators were all over us, but it was could be a huge sort of you know, line in the sand, not only for, for, for the company I was working for at the time, but also for the industry that I was working in. We got all the technical stuff right. We got all the solutions right. We got most of the, uh, most of the sales activity right. And we were into the commercials at the end. On a Friday afternoon at about 10 to 5, I was driving up to see my parents in North Yorkshire. I had my daughter with me, looking forward to a really chilled weekend. I got a call from my chief commercial lead to say, you know what, this deal's nearly there. However, the CEO wants unlimited liability for any data loss. It's a complete red line for him. There's no way he's going to sign the deal without it, and there's no way we're going to get either, Jeremy. So I, so I rang him and, and first of all said, thank you very much for giving me this at 10 to 5 on a, on, on a Friday, which is something that I encourage all of my team not to, not to do. But then, of course, we went into the solution and the solve mode. So what does that mean? So what are we going to do? Well, the CEO would like to see you. The CEO wants to sit down with you. So I'm in a car with a pair of shorts on, a pair of Adidas Gazelles and a polo T-shirt, away for the weekend without a laptop. Um, you know, there weren't such things as like iPads at the time. And I'm thinking, OK, so I'm going to walk into the CEO's office of Leeds Building Society, a billion pound revenue business on Monday afternoon in a pair of shorts and a polo shirt and try and negotiate away an unlimited liability clause that we're just not going to we're not going to we're not we're not going to agree to. Needless to say, it uh, dominated most of my, 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 my weekend's thinking. However, when I thought about what they were trying to achieve for their business and what we were trying to work to achieve for our business, it was absolutely key we solved this. And I returned back to probably the only business book that I've read cover to cover more than once and that I continue to recommend, which was Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Effective People. And I pulled out the consultative paragraph. So I thought the only way we we're going to get through this was to really for me to understand why this individual item was so important for the CEO of Leeds Building Society. I decided that I wasn't going to go and buy a suit. I wasn't going to go and buy a shirt, but no one needed to see my legs on a Monday afternoon. So I did go and buy a pair of chinos to put on to go and see the CEO. We rang up, apologised, walked into his office on, on, the, on the Monday afternoon and we started to chat. My natural position is normally to try and convince somebody of why my position would be right rather than wrong. But looking back to that, that, that chapter on, on consultative behaviour, I sat on my hands for nearly 40 minutes and asked question after question after question as to why this was so important to him. We very quickly got past the limits of liability uh, clause and actually got, got into the strategy of his business got into why it was so important that he could have his, his, uh, his technology on the cloud and how it underpinned his entire business strategy for the next five years. At the end of the 40 minutes, he sent his COO, a lady called Karen, who was so lovely away for five minutes. She came back and said, you know what? We've just spoken to our insurers. We think we can insure against the risk. So yeah, actually it's fine. We're happy to, to come to a conclusion on the limits of liability with you. Now at the time, that of course felt like a win. It felt like we'd had some success, we'd unlocked something. But more importantly, over the next five years, I saw the Leeds Building Society double in size as an organisation, win employee of the year awards year after year, continue to have success, be innovative in the market. And for me, regardless of the size of the deal or what we did, the achievement came in the success that we saw in that client. Now, I'm sure we would have got there somehow. But for me, that personal investment, that personal time, and as I look back on it, probably one of the greatest achievements I've seen in my personal career. Peter, who is the CEO of Leeds Building Society, now, 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 uh, now a non-exec at a number of different organisations, actually acted as my a professional reference into Aptitude Software Group three years ago. Uh, the chair of Aptitude happened to know Peter, and so it was fantastic to be able to talk about that story in my interview, and then that very same story to be played back by the by, by, by the CEO to, 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 to my chairman. So I really do think that patience and thinking about the activities you do on the way up will pay back dividends as you, as you come back through. And for me, that personal achievement, of course, is associated with any professional achievement that I see going forward. The final area, I think you need to market. You need to do something, you feel that achievement that you really can, can look back on. It may be 
buying a piece of jewelry. It may be going on a holiday. It might be going out for a nice meal. It might be giving yourself some space, but it's really important that you can look back and you can think about what you did to mark that achievement. Because I think it also helps you then lay the foundations and, and, and then lay the lines out to, to, uh, to the next ambition that you might, you might have. And final slide, please, Elena. So how would I say you could differentiate yourself, uh, not only in, in, uh, in, in, in tomorrow's world, but, but, uh, but certainly in, in the history of, 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 uh, of my career? I think you have to be human. You have to be yourself every time you show up, whether it's the first interview or whether it's the first engagement with your employees or your, or your, or your, or your clients, but you must be human. It's the one thing that I would say people search for more than anything when they are going to either invest in you, take a leap of faith in you. So please, please, we are bombarded by social media, by Netflix, you know, of, of what corporate life looks like, of what entrepreneurial life looks like, as to what being a good corporate citizen looks like. But please, be yourself, the, the, the makeup of you and what makes you will come almost by osmosis from people that you work with. But please stay, stay uh, central to yourself and central to your personal values. You must show some genuine passion about something. I don't mind whether the people that come and work for me have a huge passion for something that's not actually what I do, as long as I can see there's passion within them for something. I think sometimes you have a passion for something that you maybe think doesn't fit in the corporate world or in the world that you're working in. For years and years and years, I hid the fact that I was a passionate house music lover that spent most of my 20s and 30s in nightclubs till 5 a.m. But actually, I'm hugely passionate about it. I've always been passionate about music. I grew up in a generation where that was what defined me and actually I'm super proud of it to so the fact that two weeks after I joined Aptitude Software as the Chief Revenue Officer I bumped into my head of HR in Fabric Nightclub at 3am on a Saturday morning I think she was way more surprised than I was that, uh, that, 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 that a new exec member of the board was inside but I think it's really important that whatever it is you're passionate about, whether it's work, whether it's professional, whether it's personal, that comes through because I think passion drives a huge amount of activity on, on, you know, in, from a, in a professional life you know, outside, of, outside of what your job, your, your, your job world or, or your job description is. And the final thing I'd say is set out day one to leave a legacy. If you're just there to do the day job, if you're just there to do the job that the last person did or the next person did, you're simply not going to stand out. I've had interns, I've had graduates, I've had new, sale, new salespeople, new general managers um, who've come in, who completely defined the way the business I was running at the time operated because they came in with a real clear, clear, clear desire to drive change. And that's really something that takes a huge amount of energy outside of what you're being employed to do. But if you can leave a legacy and people can say, you know what, that was Elona that did that, or that was Fiona, or that was Phoebe, you know, that, that, that's, you know that you're going to make a huge difference to that business. And I think those are prepared to step outside of the role and really think about what their legacy is going to be, you know, a number of times over the, their career are really going to make a huge difference. And I think, again, it serves to, 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 to give a real indication about what your future, your future success will be like as well. OK, that's me done. Um, I'm really happy to take any questions. I think my last slide, slide says, make me think. Um, I'm really keen that if you've got any questions at all, personal or professional, uh, you, uh, you get some chance to do that. And hopefully that's been useful. We will definitely do that. That was amazing. And as somebody who I know as we, we chatted about um, yesterday has, has made some quite big career shifts in my time and, and tried to kind of figure out what's important and what works. It's amazing to see that from somebody who is at the level um, that you're at. And um, some parallels there that, that I wasn't expecting. Um, fabric for a start. Um, so brilliant to see, you know, still going strong and, and hopefully um, coming back to us um, in the next couple of weeks as, as nightclubs emerge again. Um, so just kind of um, a couple of questions um, from me. I can see that our, our pop-up 
a couple popping up in the chat. Uh, what I'd ask people to do is if you do want to ask a question yourself, just uh, raise your hand um, and I'll come to you. Just a reminder to everybody on the call, for anyone who wasn't here right at the beginning, we are recording and live streaming this. So if you are asking the question on camera, um, people will be able to see that. So just for GDPR, I need to make sure everyone's aware of that. Um, but just use the, the raise hand function or, or pop in the chat if you want to ask a question. So one of the things that, that I'm really interested in, Jeremy, is you've given such a wonderful positive spin to all of that. You know, this is what good looks like. This is what to surround yourself with. I think sometimes we don't necessarily recognise those red flags um, at the yeah. time that we should. I think we've all been um, in situations where we thought, you know what, I should have left six months before I did. I, at that point, I should have realised that, that this wasn't right for me. What are yeah. the kind of red flags that, that you might want to look for that's either this isn't the right situation for you or mm -hmm. this leader is not the person I need to be aligning myself with? Um, I think... I think most people have a pretty good gut on on um, on whether something's right or not, and I think quite often decisions that you that you make will be sitting in your gut a lot longer before your head computes the science behind it. And so, I'd, first of all, I'd say is listen to your gut, and then you back those that you back that up with data, and you back that up with the, with, 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 with with decision points. I also think that. Um, the more senior you, or the bigger roles you take, the longer it takes to nail those roles. And I do think that, you know, in your, in my twenties and my thirties, I would generally have two years in my head as to how long I would stay in a role. And sometimes it was less than that. And sometimes it was longer, longer, longer than that. Um, but I think the bigger the roles you get, the longer, that, the, the longer that investment is to work out what you're doing to build a plan and, and, and then to, to execute on it from there. So I think, You've got to choose going in whether you're prepared to make those those bigger investments and not and not just think that the future is going to it's just going to look like the past. I think if it's down to individual leadership and I, and I think if you're feeling that you're getting either um, uncomfortable, either because of the lack of progression that you're taking or because the leadership that you that you that you have in front of you you, you can't lead from uh, or you, you can't learn from, then I think really it's in it's in your gift. But I would say those are the times where it's most critical to think about two jobs ahead, because quite often, if you're looking to lift yourself out of a, a, a situation that's not good, you are more likely to take a, you know, a slightly a slightly wrong turn as opposed to really thinking about, 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 that, about that, that career planning. Um, I think it's easy to do that you're in a big organisation because generally there's more roles. It's more difficult if you're going to have to move out, of, move out of your existing role. But I would say... You know, don't ignore your gut, find some time, get that blank piece of paper out with your pencil and kind of work out, you know, what, why are you feeling like that? Um, put it away, come back to it in a month. If you still feel the same way, come back to it in a week. But you've got to get to that position because all you'll do is putting off a change that actually is detrimental to you and probably detrimental to the organisation or the, or the individual that you're working with as well. Fantastic and lovely to, to hear that, that we do know, don't we? Like we can feel when it's not right um, and actually to be able to trust that. And what brilliant advice, because yeah, I'm, I'm quite an impulsive person. So like when I've decided I'm not happy, like I'm out. Um, and I'm sure that, you know, my husband who ends up picking up the pieces would probably quite appreciate a bit of a, a month's notice as to what changes I'm going to make. So definitely something that I'm going to look at as, you know, coming back to that. Um, now, Phil has uh, has come in flying here with, with three questions um, set out in the chat. So I'm essentially just going to pass over to Phil now to fire through um, those three questions for you. There we go. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Alona, but also thank you to Jeremy. That's a really inspiring uh, talk you gave. I've got a few particularly around sort of your experiences in leadership. So yeah. first, changing culture. Um, so from those experiences, how do you as a leader drive that change in an organization so you take everyone with you? Yeah. Um, so I've been really lucky to work for, you know, a couple of organizations that take culture really, really seriously. Um, and actually, when I worked for HP, you know, there was something called the HP way, which was all about culture. And you know, we've all heard that heard the uh, heard the, uh, you know, the phrase, you know, culture, eat strategy for breakfast. And I, I, I absolutely agree with that. Um, I also believe that you can get people to do extraordinary things 
like literally run through walls for you if they believe in what the what the organization stands for or what, uh, or, what or what or what the leader stands for when i joined aptitude software um there was lots of great things about this business but it really had been a business that had been completely sales driven um, for the previous five years incredible ceo real real rainmaker as a ceo but he'd focus purely on you know if we just keep selling stuff at the front end everything else will be okay well, actually, of 300 or so people, we only have 40 salespeople, right? And whilst the growth is important, the culture of what we do and who we are and, and how we operate is really, really important. And so um, after, you know, building a bit of confidence, uh, confidence in, my, in my sort of third or fourth board meeting, I said, guys, we have to address what we're here for. We have to address our purpose. We have to address our values. We have to think of our vision statements and our mission statements. And by the way, the people around this table are the wrong people to think about that. Um, and so I embarked, um, you know, if you put your hand up for something, quite often you're going to get given it to, to own. So again, just, just a tip, if you're going to make noise, expect to own, to own that noise. Um, so I was given the, uh, the opportunity to, to own that as, 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 a, uh, as a program. So I worked with our chief people officer, and I started um, at the bottom. And when I say at the bottom, I started with a whole set of workshops with all of my employees, my developers in, 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 in Wroclaw in Poland, um, my HR team, my central functions team, some of the pre-sales functions, some of our leading consultants. And I put them all in, in, in small workshops over a period of six weeks to say, right, come and tell me what you think the culture of this organization is. And it was incredible that we started just to see the same things come up, you know, over and over about what this company was all about. Brought that together, we delivered it through, and we created a we we created a purpose, um, which is create a world of financial confidence. And that creating a world of financial confidence isn't about selling accounting software. It's about confidence for our clients. It's about confidence for our employees. About confidence for our stakeholders. And out of that dropped our values and out of that dropped our vision statements and out of that, out of that dropped, dropped, dropped all, all of our strategy. But the most important thing is that that, that purpose and those values came from within the organisation. And then for me to be able to exhibit them, you know, as the leader in my employee or hands calls is really, really easy because you're never trying to enforce or drive something into, into your key stakeholder base that wasn't already there. So for me, the people that, that you're working with should be, you, know, you should utilize that. And then all you're really doing is reflecting that back to them on a, on a regular basis. No, thank you, Jeremy. I love that about breaking it down and then sort of pulling it out so everyone embodies, yeah. well, you're embodying what they what they see as value of the organization. Yeah. I'm yeah. conscious I had loads of questions, but if I can just do one more. Um, yeah, sure. What's one of the one things you want to do, Jeremy, to develop yourself as a leader? As you mentioned, it's, you know, it's a continuous process. What's one thing that you want to do still? So I'd love to say it was only one thing, Phil. <laughs> Unfortunately, I have a list. As I look in front of you, uh, in front of me, I've got my screen and I have a, a PowerPoint slide, which has got a whole set of hexagons on. And those hexagons have some things around the business. They have some things around my team, they have things around financial performance, they have things around um, personal development. Um, and the personal development piece is, it was a long, it was a long time before I realized, because I've been in this, in this bubble of this big corporate organization, that your external work is as important as your internal network. And so um, I spent quite a lot of time as I was coming out of that big corporate and thinking about what I wanted to do, really working hard on my professional network, um, I'm a big believer in pay it forward. You know, if you if you if you put yourself out there and you help them, it will just come back to you in spades. And, and that's how it happened. When I joined Aptitude, I've had to have my head for three years, took on a new role, ton of traveling, then took on the CEO role. So I, so really I've let that personal network and that professional network sort of fall away. COVID's been awful for it as well, because you've just not been able to do to do that. So for me, this year and next year is making sure I rebuild that professional network. Um, and I, I, yeah, it's not just for fun, right? At some point. Either aptitude bored of me, or I'm going to get bored of aptitude. I'm going to want to go on to the next exec role or, or a set of plural roles. And having that foundation, so putting the scaffolding in now will allow me to do that so that I have some more choices when I come to the end of my tenure with aptitude. That's wonderful. And I can't imagine you're going to be short of choices uh, when that time comes. And absolutely singing the JCI tune there in terms of, of how important those networks are, whether you kind of you realise them at the time or yeah. not. 
Um, the final question then, uh, before we kind of go on to this um, resilience and leadership section uh, with Bianca, and, and I think from the conversation we had yesterday, we'll, we'll build in quite nicely. And that's about kind of, you know, putting boundaries on your time, making sure that, you know, you have um, time to, to rest and, and recharge. And I think even some people who had that, that sorted pre-COVID, um, that blurring of the boundaries, everything else that, that's gone on around us, you know, not having different physical spaces, um, let alone anything else, has obviously had quite a huge impact. Yeah. How have you been able to maintain that downtime for yourself and also for the people that you're leading? Yeah, so I think um, I think that's been the biggest battle for everybody at any level in the last in the last twelve months. You know, yesterday I've I'm, I'm lucky I have a garden room at the end of the, at the end of the garden, which was normally my music room. I'd normally come in here with a glass of whiskey and the paper and play some music on a Sunday afternoon. It's the last place I want to be generally for my downtime now, and so I've, I've kind of kind of built this little oasis, which has now become my work environment, but that that separation is really really important and you literally have to put it in your calendar you know i encourage all of my leadership team i encourage all of my employees you know to use whatever functional feature you can to block out time in your diary whether it's the, at the end of the day or the front of the day or in the middle of the day to go and find the time that you need to do i was exhilarated through the first couple of lockdowns and i mean because we had so much going on we had scenario planning to do new guidance to the market we were updating the board really regularly we had to talk to employees we had to make some changes in the business um the, the, the last lockdown probably like all of us have felt just completely sucked all energy out of and i suffered real lethargy um to be able to kind of get myself out and put myself out so i think you have to formally you have to more for, formally put put that th those lines in your diary i also think you need to create boundaries within your social environment and your family environment where you drive some expectation back on your back on yourself um having children and i know not everyone on the call is going to have children is, is one of those things that just puts a boundary in your diary because you have to uh, but i do think you've got to set things up you have to book appointments you have to book sessions in and I, i'm a big believer that and i sent you the article yesterday rest isn't about just sleeping it's about doing something that is a distraction. It's about doing something that is completely away from a screen. It's about doing something that's out in the fresh air. Um, and if you don't, if you if you don't have all those different kinds of rest, you're going to wake up every morning feeling shattered because the brain is just not used to the to, to, to the screen time. So create the boundary physically within your calendar. Make sure that you you ask for demands on others to create some boundaries in, in, in yourself, but also work out what are the things that give you that energy. So my half a day fishing or my kind of drive out in the wild in, in a car are some of the things I know I have to do on a monthly basis. I do my, my, my personal training once a week because I absolutely have to, otherwise I just end up the size of a house. I don't I hate it, but I know I have to do it, right? And I do it in this room and I do it at 11 o'clock every Tuesday. And no, nobody, no, no, no meetings get booked. No, no, you know, not not the board, not the exec, not the leadership team. Because if I don't do it at the same time every week, it simply doesn't get done. So for me, if I can do it at, at the role I'm doing, I think everybody can find the time to do that, and nobody should be ashamed of it either. Fantastic. And it's again, it's brilliant to hear that from somebody at the top of the organisation, really putting the emphasis. Um, that article that you sent me is amazing. Um, I read it after you sent it through and I'll find the link um, and drop it in the chat because I think it's it's really useful because we do all have that moment, don't we, where you go to bed and you think, I'm absolutely shattered. Why can't I sleep? Why have I slept and I'm still tired? And actually yeah. understanding those, those different types of rest, I think, will be really important. Um, I've obviously come into a kind of a, a very fortunate position where I'm now running my own company and I'm able to block out those things and yeah. you know one of those things that I do is, is yoga at nine o'clock every morning I do it over zoom with a friend who lives in yeah. Spain and as we're starting to get busier there is that temptation to be like well maybe I don't need to do that and actually yeah it's really encouraged me to kind of think no actually like maintain that little slot in because yeah. it's the something that, that helps me to switch off and to rest so thank you ever so much for joining us I know you're gonna hang around for a little bit today yeah. I should also let everybody know that one of Jeremy's really key things is, is keeping his weekends free and sacred and not working. So absolutely beyond grateful that you've given up your time with us this morning to, to share that, that knowledge with us. Um, I know it's going to be really, really valuable. Yeah. Um, so next, um, we I are coming through to... Before Sorry? we wrap it up with Jeremy, uh, I just want to say thank you 
Jeremy, personally, um, I think we've known each other nearly 10 years now. Yeah, we have. Before yeah. JCI, and this is one of the things about keeping your network open and just, you know, being friends with people and you just see how, you know, they've progressed over the years. And I just thought when I took this role as national president, I really want to get you in to speak to us. And I'm so happy it's come through. So thanks so much. I think oh, it's been just really inspiring to hear everything that you've um, done for your career. And I think from the comments, everybody is really inspired and still have a lot of questions for you. So if you could hang around, I think that'll be really fantastic. So thank yeah. you so much. All right, good. Thank you. Thanks there will all. be definitely. Um, and really interesting as well, like seeing the kind of leader that Phoebe is. Um, I can definitely see that whether there was any official mentoring went on there or whether it's just Phoebe being inspired by the way that you do things. There are a lot of things that, that echo through and, and the way that she runs this team and, and leads in her personal professional life absolutely echoes that that value driven, um, inspiring leadership. So now moving on, Bianca. Um, now I know that Bianca has just been nodding away through so much um, of what Jeremy's been saying. Um, there's lots of kind of issues there that are, are so relevant um, to this idea of resilience in leadership. And it's it's something that, that we've spoken about a number of times and that when we were well, looking at Sorry, some noise there um, in the background. Um, so yeah, when we've been chatting about it and we're looking at what workshop would we put into this, what kind of issues we want to do, we were suddenly like, oh yeah, like resilience, because that's the thing that we keep talking about um, in kind of, you know, with each other and with other people. So um, I introduced you um, quickly at the start, but do you want to just like let us know a bit about, you know, your, your five million different things that oh, you have going yeah. on at the moment? <laughs> <laughs> literally so hello to everyone who's here most of you i know but i'm so happy as well to see so many new faces from so many different countries one of the things i love about jci is just the expansion of the network and the fact that it's global so i'm really happy today that you'll all be kind of meeting people that you probably haven't met today as well um so i'm this year's director of training and partnerships I'm also, um, as Alona said, <laughs> a life coach. Uh, that's, that's my absolute passion um, and calling in life. I, through the pandemic as well, opened up a food business. Uh, so in the absolute like worst sector possible that you could go into business, I decided it was a good time to do it um, when everyone else wasn't. And that has gone fantastically well. So I've just recently opened another arm of that um, business as well with my sister and my mum um yeah alongside that I also run a um a group for coaches uh, doing mentoring I run that twice a month I'm obviously on the board this year for JCI UK but I also hold a board position in uh, the female hospitality network as the UK life coach as well so there's many different things that I do um obviously um when you are so busy as well Resilience is super, super important, but it's also important um, that we're not trying to use resilience in places that are not worthy of our resilience. And so when me and Alona have this conversation about resilience, uh, the thing that came up for us was how it's being used against people um, in the current climate to encourage them to overwork and, and to accept conditions that they shouldn't be accepting. So today, what we've done um, is a very interactive learn by doing workshop for you so that you can have a look um, from an outside perspective at, at, at some scenarios that you may be familiar with and reflect on what the next best steps are for those individuals in those scenarios to do. Because I think quite often we're a lot harsher on ourselves than we are uh, on other people and we can see other people's problems and the solutions quite clearly so getting you into that um, learning by doing state of mind and um, getting you to collaborate with other people to to actually learn which is the nature of JCI is something that we're really keen on doing this morning as well both myself and Alona um, have worked for companies where resilience <laughs> Resilience was championed at our expense. And, you know, therefore we've both gone on to open up our own businesses. And for some people that's an option, but for others it actually isn't. And it isn't what you desire to do. So this workshop is suitable for anyone um, today. And 
yeah, we hope that you're really going to find it useful. Wonderful. So I'm going to ask if while we just cover a couple of points, um, Phoebe is able to split delegates into three groups um, and we will, as we're doing that, explain how the workshop's going to run. Just thought it might be useful before we start talking about resilience that, that we maybe just do a little step back as to actually what what is resilience. Like we throw it about, we talk about you know you know you need to build up your emotional resilience. Resilience is important in leadership. How would you go about trying to define what resilience is, I mean, or what it's perceived to be, which might be more important for some of these yeah. exercises? I mean, I think when you kind of look at the dictionary definition of resilience, it's like the the ability to bounce back quickly um, from from different situations. And I think um, bouncing back quickly can be quite toxic, uh, particularly if there's something for you to learn from a situation. Um, and and quite often when we go through things, it isn't about kind of bouncing back to where we were before. It's about changing and becoming a different person off the back of that experience. And I think sometimes when you kind of look at the, the standard definition of it, there are things about it that need to be to be tweaked. For me, resilience is about, you know, flexibility and it, and it is about endurance and it is about learning new skills and, and getting better um, in areas that serve to improve your life and the lives of other people as well. But, but no way is it about sacrificing one good part of your life, you know, for another. It's not a trade-off uh, resilience for me. It's definitely something that is inclusive of your growth journey. And there are healthy ways to go about doing that. You know, there's looking at mindset, there's setting goals, um, celebrating what you do, understanding that there is a certain uh, element of pain that comes with growth. But, but it shouldn't be excruciating pain, you know, and it should be pain that you're supported through um, in a practical way as well. So I think, you know, when you, um, if you talk to people in the coaching world, you talk about, you know, facing your fears and, and having courage and taking a leap and things like that, they all require a certain amount of resilience. But I think the issue with um, resilience is quite often in the corporate world, it is just used as something to um, make you feel as though you should be doing more than what was originally required from you in your role. And that's where we kind of want to clearly define today what, what it actually is. And, you know, when you're going too far, what does that look like in, what, in, in the work setting, you know? What, what do you think, Alona, for you? Because I know you've had so many different um, situations at work. <laughs> Your different roles like how would you define resilience for you personally yeah so for me um and i don't want to give too much away before we kind of go into to these workshops and, and we'll come back and, and talk about some of those um experiences as we are kind of go through the scenarios but i think for me um <laughs> i'm going to use the most random thing here and it's not going to be great for a, an international audience so apologies does everybody know like the dime bars like there used to be a dime bar advert and for people who don't have dime bars they're like crunchy on the middle and like chocolate on the outside and the advert was that armadillos were crunchy on the outside and, and soft in the middle and dime bars were not an armadillo and it was the most ridiculous advert and my husband used to call me an armadillo because of this because he was like no one knows that you're squishy on the inside because for me like being resilient and being successful was, was building this wall. And it was like, no matter what was thrown at me, no matter what I had to deal with, it was like, that that's what you saw. That's what I presented to the world. And um, some people would call me aware, like my background was in commercial litigation. So it was, it was you know, that, that fight mode um, quite often. And like the, the squishy bit was kind of, you know, hidden in the middle and, and not that many people saw it. And as I've kind of developed and have gone through different situations and, and some really kind of challenging, stressful times, it's kind of come closer and closer to being like, no, actually, like people can see that soft side. People can see like the emotion. They can see, you know, when when things are difficult, when I'm happy, when I'm sad. And that resilience is actually kind of being OK in that and being like, no, no, they are my feelings. That is my personality. And it doesn't that doesn't stop me from being strong and it doesn't stop me from being resilient. It's just so much more authentic than, than building up that wall. Yeah. 
definitely and I think a lot of people can resonate with that in, like in the chat here and there's a lot of you know I remember going back to when I was in had my first leadership position at 17 and so you know I didn't know much about much to be fair except for I was very very good at, at my role um but definitely because of the fact that I was young I was one of you know there was I think there were around 250 managers but the only female the only black female the only one that was under 20 years old so for me I very much had a similar wall to you in that you know I didn't want to show that anything affected me at all so I would be found to be working you know 60 I think I think I bragged once about working like 74 hour week like ooh, check me out you know loser absolute loser because <laughs> I was you know, I was on a good wage until I started working 74 hours and dividing what I was actually earning per hour. And I just thought, oh my God, what are you doing, Bianca? But, but it was the culture at the time as well. And so, you know, I was trying to fit in. Um, I didn't want to be seen to be um, too young, too feminine, too whatever it was. But, but eventually you end up going so far away from yourself that your own creativity and your own sense of direction and what you want in life fades in this facade as well because it's almost as if you're you're operating on, on on no emotion you know and then you don't have that inspiration that you need to do what Jeremy says and carve out the next few years of your um, career you're literally going day by day just trying to get through it and um, so I can definitely resonate with that and I think that people admire that transparency of vulnerability which is what you're talking about here because whether or not people um, people will share that they also feel the same, it's hugely inspiring to know that other people are human because you know we all are and we all feel things. So yeah, I think that's a great message for people to take away today as well. Absolutely, and echo so nicely some of those points that, that Jeremy made in, it, in his presentation about that kind of you know human first and, and aligning with values. So we are now going to split people up into three groups. Do you want to explain all three scenarios first, and then we've got documents that will will drop into the different breakout rooms? Is is that how we're planning on doing this? Yeah, Amazing. so uh, we'll just like I'll magically appear in one of your breakout rooms and drop you a document in there as well to make sure that you don't all take the same one, but me and Alona were kind of talking and I was talking about some of the clients that I work with because my main area is career and business um, and some of the things that they um, endure and I put together three scenarios for you one of the classic you know overworked and underpaid um, one where actually you, you're kind of in a dream job but it's a very toxic environment and people are quite gossipy in that environment and then the third one is um, looking at like balancing that role of, of middle management which is hugely hugely challenging when you want to be a good leader and then you've got people putting a lot of pressure on you as well um so yeah i'm sure that everyone can relate to one of those scenarios and you will have people in the group sharing their experience but what i've also done on there is put six questions for you to reflect on um, to determine what the next best steps are for this person so that we can start thinking about uh, how we make healthy choices in our career um, and how we advise other people when they when they come to us as well so yeah great experience and then when we come back we'll have a look at some of the things that we can do to prevent burnout and prevent these situations from occurring in the first place and before we break it out yeah. if you have any questions or anything we are going to drop into the groups as well to kind of see how we're getting on but if there's any burning questions you can drop them in if not Phoebe will make you disappear into a breakout room fantastic Hi, <laughs> I think everybody is in, in the breakout room. One second. Go, Phoebe. All right, no worries. Thank you so much for joining today. And no, not at all. we're going to carry on the rest of the day. Thanks. Good luck with the rest. Thank you. Bye.